So I'm going to give you six reasons why marriages and relationships are not working. But they are supposed to work. But if they are not working, it could be attributed to one of these reasons. So in the next 35 to 40 minutes, I'll try and speak about the reasons. One of the main reasons why relationships or marriages may not be working is because of prayerlessness in the marriage. When there is no prayer in the marriage, the marriage goes through an attack and there is no barrier or barricade or resistance because the walls of the relationships and the walls of the marriage are broken down. But prayer will raise the walls of the marriage. Say amen. I see you reintroducing prayer into your marriages one more time. And into your relationships. If you are in a relationship with somebody and you are planning for a marriage, I think that you should spend more time praying than to spend time doing other things. Say amen. And so because the reason why more prayer is needed is because in the book of James, chapter number 5, and the verse 13, the Bible said something very important. It said, is any among you afflicted? Is any among you afflicted? And when you Google the word affliction, it will give you several meanings on what the word affliction means. Is any among you, that means not all of us, but is any among you afflicted? Then the same Bible prescribes a cure to the affliction. It said, let that person pray. It didn't say let that person go see a doctor or a therapist or uh, a psychologist because sometimes when you are afflicted which means when you are when you are miserable when you are depressed when you are oppressed when you are going through pain and suffering and challenges and nervous breakdown or you are going through a certain emotional turbulence in your marriage sometimes the tendency is for you to look for somebody to offload or to tell that person what you are going through but the first prescription, then the first cure to your turbulent marriage or to your troubled relationship is prayer. And that is why, take note, the enemy fights your prayer in the marriage more than anything else. The thing that must gel and bring solution is the thing that is mostly fought. So you can see that any time you resort in prayer, you find it very lazy or very challenging to go on even for just 10 minutes. It's like, I want to pray about my relationship. I want to pray about my marriage. And the prayer can only last for like three minutes. But if it is quarreling and conversations and watching movies, you can do it for a long hours. People can watch movies to 2 a.m. He can be watching series. Wrong marriage, part one, part two, part now it is in part 89. It's on social media. Wrong mar- is it not wrong marriage? What, what is it? Yeah, wrong marriage. It's in part 89. Ben and Mark and there's fighting and everything. You can watch it. Uh, but when you must sit somewhere or sit in your bedroom or hall or, or come to the house of God and spend an hour, two hours at the altar, Praying about your troubled marriage, you find it very difficult. You have a lot of reasons and excuses why you cannot devote an hour or two or spend an all night praying about your troubled wife or your troubled wife or your sick spouse, which is tearing the marriage apart. There was a marriage that was just about one month old, Kato. And you know it. The, the guy was plagued with a certain disease. And the marriage lasted for how many hours? How many years? Four or five years. Four years. 
only one month enjoyment of the marriage. The person became sick uh, and died. We buried him this weekend. We buried the person this weekend. Last Friday. One month after the marriage. That means that the enemy attacks marriages. That whole thing about wedding, whatever, don't know. Do. He hates it. <laughs> he hates the don't know. Do. He hates the whole, the whole marriage ceremony. That is why the Bible is saying, what God has put together, let no matter. Which means that there is a man, there is a woman, there is a spirit that wants to put asunder what God has put together. There are some, somebody who came and said, Reverend, I don't know what I'm doing in my marriage. I'm not enjoying my marriage. Yesterday, I met a gentleman, Kato. This guy is, is about 30 years. And I said, what happened to your marriage? What's happening? He said, oh, Reverend, I'm taking my time. I said, why are you taking that? He said, one of my colleagues, the same age, we're in the same class, same age, got married earlier, five years ago. Now he said, daddy, the guy is divorced. And the, the girl is with him. The small girl is with him. They had a child. Then I said, so what happened? This was what he said. What he said was, would surprise you. This is a normal marriage where we are happy, we've eaten together, we have drunk, we have slept, we have made love and everything. Then the lady woke up at dawn, came to listen to this at dawn, and said to the guy, I am tired of this marriage. I'm leaving you. Just like that. He said, ah, just like that. He says, yes, I'm not happy in this marriage. He said, ah, what have I done? He said, you haven't done anything to me. You are a correct guy. This house is beautiful. But me, I'm not a happy person. I was a happier person when I was single. But this whole married thing is not for me. So I'm leaving you. I was very shocked. This was the reason. Which means that the enemy has attacked his mind, her mind. Taking the joy out. Then I asked this, my son, who was telling me about this, his friend, that ah, was the guy abusive? He said, no. And the girl accepted testified that this guy, is, he said, you're a correct person. You are not abusive. You don't, you don't insult me. You have never beaten him before. Five years, we have a beautiful girl, but I am a problem. I'm not a happy person. But beloved, things just don't happen like that. It means that her mind, her being was at by the enemy and after they have eaten together, made love together and, and at dawn he, she wakes up there husband and said I am leaving you you haven't done anything, I am not a happy person yes and guess what, by the close of that day she had packed and left to the father's house and they are divorced today and the guy was so traumatized that five years on he is still single he said I don't She's gone to see the father. They've gone to beg the girl. He said, no, my husband has not I am not just happy. You see, that's what I'm saying that don't leave prayer out of your marriage. Because there is an enemy out there attacking the sanctity of the marriage. Attacking the joy of the marriage. Attacking the peace of the marriage. And, and attacking the mindset of one of the spouses. If you take marriage out of of your relation, if you take prayer out of your relationship, what you have is fightings and confusion. Am I talking to somebody here? We are still in the month of love. And some people, guess what? Some people's love has dried up. There is no feeling of love in the marriage. No affection. No affection, no sex, no kissing, no holding of hands, no holding, no cuddling, no hugging. The marriage is as dry as the desert. No cuddling, no excitement. There's no play. There's no holiday. There's no joy. There's nothing like, let's go to Riga restaurant or China. Let's have something to eat. There's nothing like that. It is the same Benkuna and where this are about bread. It means that something, am I talking to somebody here? Something 
is missing in the love relationship. And the only thing that can gel both of you together is the power of prayer. There is a saying, it's not biblical, but it's a saying that the family that prays together stays together. So if you are here and you are losing love for your spouse and you are losing affection and for the past two months you haven't met as husband and wife, and every day you are tired and you are snoring beside your spouse. It means something is going wrong. The marriage has been afflicted. And the cure for that affliction is prayer. The reason why some people are not clapping is because you haven't made up your mind to correct the mistake in the marriage through prayer. It's like you want it to be like that. So that one day your spouse will get up and say that, look, let's call it off. Let's call it a quit. Sometimes, look, you can, you can easily be in a relationship and the feeling that you used to have for each other some years ago, no, that feeling is not there. If you look at the same girl you married, she's changed. She has become too skinny or too fat or too something. The hair is too short or too long and whatever. She's grown too dark or too fair. Or whatever the guy you marry has a big belly now, she has become bald <laughs> or something. She's no more looking sexy and all that. You know that your mind is going to your old boyfriend with that you left. The devil will just attack your mind to put asunder what God has put together and to tell you who is single that don't enter marriage again. There are some people who are so traumatized in their marriage, they don't want to even hear about marriage. One of my daughters comes around and everything and said, oh, you've been divorced for the past six years. When are you going to get? No, 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 daddy. I'm thinking of better things. Yeah, that's what they say. I'm thinking of better things, not marriage. He said, he said since that man left me, I have peace. He said, he said daddy, I have peace. This is how she said it. She said, I have peace. I don't want trouble again. Like yeah. And you, and you know what she said? She said to me, said, when I wake up, I don't have to think of what we shall eat. Serve the table, draw a menu, do banku. He said, my husband is a banku person. And every day I'm on the stove. See, that thing is over. I have peace. <laughs> oh my God. What a world. But prayer will bring the cure. Get up and come to the altar. Get up and come to an that. Find time. Take days off and fight for your relationship. Especially if you are a lover of the relationship. You don't know why things have gone so bad in your once upon a time, a glorious relationship. It's an affliction. And the cure for affliction is prayer. Not a doctor. Not a married counselor, a foot to end sister nipa. Say amen. Yeah. It's, it's a demonic thing. And sometimes you'll be surprised. You will be surprised where the attack is coming from. It's coming from somebody or somewhere or something that has been admiring your relationship for a time. And out of jealousy, are working behind the scenes to put asunder what God has put together. And it, the enemy has no choice than to manifest his nature. And his nature is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came to put it together. Hallelujah. And the Bible said in the verse 16, I love verse 16. The verse 16 of the same James, he says, look at it, verse 16. He says, he said, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. It means it mean that your relationship needs healing. And sometimes we confess our faults one to another and pray for one another that there may be healing. You are not married. You are not married. You are in a relationship. 
But the relationship is full of fightings and quarrelings. The relationship you are in which is supposed to end at the altar has come to the altar already. It means you are behaving like marriage couples. You are staying together. You are eating together. You are doing stuff together. When you, we have been, when you have been brought the relationship for us to bless it. And it is possible. It means that you are digging a wrong foundation for the, for the marriage. See, man? He said, keep the scripture there, please. Keep the scripture there. That it may be the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, a believed man. Which means that a righteous man who is praying, your prayers are powerful and effective. That is why the enemy is preventing you from praying. Because your prayers will avail much. So when you feel lazy to pray, you feel lazy to get up, you are feeling lazy for anything spiritual, you are feeling lazy. You are a woman, you are feeling lazy to pray. It's giving a foothold to the enemy. But I see cure coming into your home. This is the month of love. I pray that love is returning to your home. I say love is returning to your heart. God must give you love for your husband again. God must give you love for your wife again. That is going to make, going to make you complete. You are incomplete until you have love again. And don't pretend to be happy with that love. You need it. It is part of what, what makes you who you are. To be loved. To love and to be loved. Say amen. So, the reason why sometimes your relationship is not working is because you are not investing a lot of prayer in the relationship. You don't join your hands together. You can't remember the last time you held your wife together in prayer. You don't remember the last time the family joined their hands. I'm not saying you should do it every day, but once in a while, hold each other's hand and pray intensely. Pray for one another. Call the children. Me, me, when I was growing up, I never cared to. I never saw my, mother, my, my father pray. I saw my mother pray, but I never saw my father, who is the, the head of our mother. He has never called for a prayer meeting before. He's always drunk. And as a man in the family, God has made you the priest of the family. You are the priest. You must fulfill your priesthood ministry. And you, one of your priesthood ministry is to bring the family to the altar. Say amen. Are you here or you have gone somewhere? Yeah. Bring your family to the altar. You are also the king of the family. As a king, you have, you have a domain. And you must make sure that nobody invades your domain. Somebody is after your pretty wife. The wife that you don't like, you know, somebody is after her. You have no clue. Somebody is having sleepless nights over the wife you don't want to see. You would think that your wife has become too big. Somebody likes the, the size. And it, and it is because of purity, holiness in man. That is why your wife hasn't thrown herself into the arms of that man. Because the things that you are doing, not caring for her, not talking to her, not whatever, no. if she is moved by something, she would throw herself at the person whose who arms are open. And no woman is ugly. There's no ugly woman. One day I, I saw on Facebook, they showed the face of a woman. Before and after. It's like light and darkness. It's called beauty and the beast. Makeup change the woman. So the woman you think that she's... Uh, hey, don't fool yourself. Let me tell you something. One lady in my church entered into some realms and the big man in that realm was dying for her. Then I said, ah, but this guy, then I was there, I said, but this guy is old. He said, hey, daddy, of Pemise Bibi. 
Then she said, "Na me kunu so ohun mi o." Me kunu ohun mi. Papa pay. He's a big man. I mean, he's a big big pa. A woman. There's no ugly woman. <laughs> There's no ugly woman. That is why sometimes you go and bring a house help from some Tokomo village somewhere. And then you bring the house help to the house. Before you realize your husband is lasting after the house help. There's no ugly woman anywhere. Because if you look at your husband, and you look at yourself, and you look at your house help, you are wondering what is in the house help that your husband is lasting after. There's no ugly woman anyway. So the wife that God has given to you that you are doing church, they will take care of her. Say amen. One day I saw one of my pastor's wife come to me. I said, why are you so gloomy like that? He said, I'm having problems. I said, what problems are you having? He said, it's your son. I said, what's wrong with my son? He said, he's not caring at all. He's not loving. I said, why? Are you not satisfying my son? He said, I'm doing everything. But he's so stiff, he's like a cassava in the house. So I asked my son, why are you like cassava in the house? He said, what are you talking? I said, you always come to complain to me that you are like cassava. And you are there. You are not affection and everything. Then I said to him, there are people in your wife's office who are dying for your wife. And your wife is telling me that she feels like throwing herself at them. He said, daddy, I'll kill them. <laughs> I said, so do you have feelings for her? He said, yes. Then show it. Demonstrate it. Let her feel that she is wanted. Don't assume. Assumption is the matter of all mess ups. You are assuming that she is always there. It doesn't work that way. Play your role as a man. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. Look at it. 21, 22. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And look at the next verse. I love the next verse. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven. We said, Thou my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. As people had lined up to be baptized, Jesus also, also was in a queue in the line. To be baptized, but he was praying, and the heavens were open as people have been announced, lined up to be married. And you also get it married and praying, the heavens will open on your marriage. And there is nothing like an open heavens on a marriage, on a relationship. There are things you are doing practically. I have one of my sons who slept in the couch of their house for six months, and his wife left him. Because how do you sleep in a couch? For six months. What's wrong with you? Is that what you have been taught in this house? You are sleeping in the couch. For six months. And leave your marital bed. But they both come to church. And one of the things that annoyed me about this guy was that. Anytime he comes around. He behaves very very spiritual. Very very spiritual. You can see that all his pretense. Meanwhile, your home is breaking. So the day the home broke, I was the only one in shock. I was very much in shock because they didn't appear that they had problems. But they had deep-seated problems. And the day I sat with them to hear them, I was flabbergasted. The problems they were having. Meanwhile, when they came around, they were all full of smiles. There are people smiling at me, but their homes are cracking. May God heal our homes, heal our marriages, heal our relationships. Bring back the feeling of love one more time in this month of love. Amen. Are you clapping or you are not clapping? The second reason why marriages are not working is because of unfaithfulness. The Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 6. 
the Proverbs 20 verse 6. Look at what the Bible says. It says, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find. It means it is not easy to find a faithful man. But a faithful man who can find. It is not easy to find. You see, when you see the word man there, it is used as man for the sake of personification. But it is neuter gender. It means that it applies to both man and woman. But a faithful woman who can find. A faithful woman. One of the things that I thank God for my life is I don't travel and I'm checking on where my wife is, who is she with. I don't do those things because otherwise it would have been very disastrous for me. That I've traveled and I'm calling every minute. Where are you? Why, what are you doing there? Whatever. Who are you with? Who are you talking to? No. Because God has given me a faithful woman. Amen. Yes, a faithful woman. Amen. And I'll say it anyway. Amen. I have never traveled anywhere, gone anywhere to do missions or preach anywhere. And I have slept thinking that my wife is in somebody's arms. No. In my 35 years of marriage. Yeah. I've never seen another man arms around my wife arms or kissing or whatever. It doesn't happen. I don't think about it. I don't even think it is possible. If somebody come and tell me that I saw your wife on somebody's bed. I said, no, it's not my he looks, She looks like my wife. It's not my wife. Am I talking to somebody here? So, a faithful woman who can find. A faithful man who can find. May you be a faithful woman. May you be a faithful man. And it is not too late for you to change your unfaithfulness. It's not too late at all. Because there are different chemistry in every man. Different chemistry. Some people come from a polygamous society. Which means that your, your gene, your genealogy is prone to mom women. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, gene, it's a gene problem. One of my, one lady came here one time to come and look for me and he had three children. She had three children. So she called my name. And the way she called my name, I realized that this is a, a relative. Because when you are a relative, there's a way you call. So when she called me, I said, yeah, there's, a, there's a way you mention the name that shows that you are from the house. So when she said, yeah, where are you? Where are you? I mean, who are you? Then she says, he said, I'm one of your, I don't know what that cousin wants. I said, how come? Give me the relation. He said, he said, your grandfather married your grandmother. I said, yeah, I know that. I know my grandmother. He said, but your grandfather had other wives. And we are the children of your grandfather. I said, really? So you are how many? He said, we are four. Then she mentioned all the four. And all this, I never knew that those people were not from my grandmother. Are you getting me? That means that my grandfather, other wives, these are her, so my grandfather's other wives, other wife children, they are my what? I don't understand it. They are my aunties. Okay, well, they are my aunties. Yeah. And then she had three children. So she is coming to me to help her to look after them because her, her home broke, the husband walked out and she's in crisis. That's the way she introduced herself to me. So you can see that in the gene, eh, there is a, a spirit of polygamy in it. Be because most of my uncles didn't stay with one woman. They had other women and other children. And we who were born as cousins, we had they had other women and other children. Can I tell you? They say it's a sickness. <laughs> You're looking at me. You should check your genealogy. <laughs> check it. So you are prone to polygamy. You are prone to having more women. Yeah, you are prone to having more women. But you have to work at it. My grandmother had. 13 children. 
but with four men. My grandmother. And I never knew. So three is on one side, four the other. Four different. And by the time my grandmother was dying, that's my mother, my mother's side. By the time she was dying, she had no man in her life. But her children. So when you come from a polygamous background, you have to continue to pray that you stay married to one woman. Because the thing in the gene in the bloodline will tell you that you are tired of this one. Get another one. You are tired of this one. Get another one. And sometimes tribal sentiments can kick in. Your tribe, they don't stay with one woman. That's why there are some families, they don't sign all this one man, one wife, one man, one wife. <laughs> yeah. They want to remain very polygamous. But you are a Christian. I said you are a Christian. You have become born again. You have done the wedding. You have signed a certificate. You have no choice. The marriage must work so that you, you break that cycle. Yeah, that cyclical spiral way of living where you have where you are married, but you have different types of children. I've married one woman, and I don't intend to have another woman to marry again. And the vow I made 35 years ago is till death do us part. So I'm on that time trajectory. Till death do us part. You are not leaving me. I'm not leaving you. Even I, I told my wife, if I find you in somebody's house, I'll come and fight that person and bring you back to the house. I'll come and fight that person and bring you back to the house. Whatever it is, let's talk about it. Yeah, where we belong. So that our children will grow with the mind that you don't break a home. Otherwise, we will not start a new generation. It will be a spiral, cyclical way that we must have more children, more wives, more husbands. Repeating the cycle. But there are some demonic cycles that must end. And you must end it. You must end it. As a young man, end it. Don't follow the foolishness of your father. The mistakes of your father. One man had, one man married. Francis is a pity. He had seven children with four women. It is, it is his, his father did more. His father had more. There are more children from different women. And he also had more children. And his son, his sons, his sons, his two boys are going there. His first marriage broke, the second one broke. He has children. They are following a certain pattern. And the pattern there, if you joke with it, it will follow you. If you joke with the pattern, it will follow you. One gentleman had a child with a colored woman at age 20. His son also at the age 20 went and married another colored woman. And you see, he married a colored woman, had a child, and divorced the woman. His son also grew up to become 20 years, married a colored woman, and at, at the age 20, he has already divorced. It's in the blood. It's following. Be careful what is following you. It's generational. Am I in church? I've gone somewhere. Yeah. So, so unfaithfulness can follow you. And our fathers, they were very, very unfaithful. Our fathers, our grandfathers, oh, they had children. They were not faithful men. So we are now trying to create and, and start a generation of faithful men and faithful. And it's not easy for us. Are you clapping or you're not clapping? Yeah. That is why a faithful man who can find and never make reference to your unfaithful father is not a good reference to make. When your father married many women and had many children, but it is not my fault. It's not my fault. Even my father had so many people. You know, that, 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 so all this talking you are talking is not my fault. 
My grandfather has many wives. And how many children? They helped him in the farm. And my, grand, my grandfather too. My great grandfather too had many wives. My father. And my father too, me like this, I'm the sixth born of about five women and all that. So what I'm doing, you know, I'm following the tradition of the family. Nonsensical, my brother. The standard of your father is not your standard. You are born again. You are a royal person. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. You have to do your best to break that cycle and then teach your children that when you make a vow, you stay within the vow. I'm not saying you are perfect. Nobody is perfect here. Nobody is perfect here. We are all learning by the day. We are all struggling to remain in by the day. I met one of my bishop and he was my one friend bishop. He said, Steve, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. He said, how is Abbas? I said, I'm fine. I said, how is your, your, your wife? He said, oh, we are fine. We are on it. It's a struggle. We are on it. I said, why do you mean? He said, oh, it's a struggle. Reverend Steve, it's a struggle. And I'm, I'm trying to be, to, be, to, be, to be a faithful man. <laughs> That's what he said. I said, I'm trying to be a faithful man. There's always some faithfulness all over my place. May God help you to become a faithful man. First Corinthians chapter 4, 1 to 4. Look at what the Bible said. First Corinthians chapter 4, 1 to 4. Look at the Bible. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Or, moreover, it is required in marriage that a man be found faithful. Moreover, it is required in marriage that a woman be found faithful. And that word faithful means to be constant, to be loyal, to be accessible, to be dependable, to be trustworthy. That's what faithfulness means. To be faithful means to be dependable, to be loyal, to be accessible. You must be a man who is constant. You made a vow. Stick to, it is not easy to stick to vows. The moment you make a vow, something in you wants to break that vow. Am I talking to somebody here? To be dependable. And sometimes it's not easy. But your genuine effort is appreciated by God. That you want to be dependable. You must be accessible. You must be constant there for the family, dependable. Your family must depend on you. And you must show yourself trustworthy. And, 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 and beloved, forget about your past mistakes. His new wife to me. Yeah, it's my uncle. Introduced his new wife. So, so I said, uncle, so this is my world. Oh, no matter, just simple three. <laughs> simple three. So to them, dear... <laughs> Three is minimum. You can go beyond three. <laughs> so I, I remember when I, when I met my wife, I said, honey, me, my background is not good. Mother side, father side, all married, all divorced. So I said, how about yours? He said, me too, they say it. It's a challenge. But I said, you and I, we have to make up our mind. It is, we have to make it up that we will not break this relationship. We are staying together. It's a decision we have made. It's a no matter. That is why first, personally my wife and I, we don't quarrel for more than 24 hours. That we are in the house a whole day we don't talk. The third day we don't talk. Day, no. I will talk right now because I hate to be alone. I can't be alone at all. I want to talk to somebody. That I'm in the house you by, bypass me. I also bypass you. We don't talk. No. So when I said one month now we don't we one month now we don't talk for two months now. No. How can you be in the house for two months and not talking? How can you be in a marital relationship and two months you are not talking? What now is the problem by which we cannot solve? One person must humble himself or herself to apologize to bring peace to the home. One person must be a fool in a marriage. 
And how do the children feel when their parents are not talking? And it's going on for days, for weeks, for months. And they see their parents come to church. They come for communion. They bring the offering. And they are not talking. Eight weeks. We need a cure. Your disease needs a cure. Say amen. Talk. And me, the way my life is, I'll talk to you by all means. It's like, I don't, I, sometimes I forgot it that we are, we are even fighting. <laughs> I forget. So I'm going to ask, can you do a check for me? Can you give me this? Can you, I, 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 I say, ah, why are you not responding? Then I go, ah, we are fighting. <laughs> I forgot that we are fighting. <laughs> I'm going to be fighting. <laughs> because I am somebody who is not who is not who is not independent at all. And I'm not an independent person at all. I depend on my wife and my for everything. I can't write, I can't take a checkbook and even write a simple check. I'm not even too sure what I've written. I don't transfer money, I don't do anything. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I need help. And when I am not well, it's like a big baby who is not well in the house. I'm a big baby with kutu on me. <laughs> and I'm doing small injection. And, I, and when you bring me my medication, you have to crocro me to take my own medication. When I don't feel that crocro, then I won't take it. You can, you can never bring me medication that I should still get up and take your medication. I will take it, bro, and swallow. No, 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 no. no. When you say you brought my medication, I will not even reply, bro, as if I have a head. And I'll be lying down. You have to wake me up. Steve, I'm talking to you. Are you okay? Get up, take your, eat something, take your medication. Then I'm lying down. You, you, and I'm expecting you to come back again. I'm expecting it. The way my life is, I'm expecting you to come. Wake me up. Let me sit up. Hold the medicine, put the glass of water in my hands, put the medicine in my palm, stand there and let me take my medication. That's the way my life is. So if I'm not talking to you, how do, I, how do you do all these things for me? That's why I, mean, I don't have time for quarrel at all. I can't quarrel. I mean, she is, ah. <laughs> yeah. When my wife leaves me, she says she's going for a meeting somewhere. We have a women something, something, somewhere. She go after one o'clock. I call. I say, where are you? Having to close from that meeting. <laughs> he said, Steve, do you want something? I say, yes. I want to eat lunch. He said, but I hear the lunch is on the table. Eh, I, don't, I, could, I didn't see it. I didn't see the lunch. Once she's not there, there's no lunch on the table. I was telling somebody that me when I go and preach and I come at one a.m. My wife has to get up. One a.m. I've arrived. She cannot continue sleeping when I have arrived. No, 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 no. You have to get up. Come and sit at my table and be watching me eat. You see that she's watching me and dozing. I like it like that. Now for you to continue to sleep. I need company. I need to listen to news. I need to eat some, drink some orange juice. I need something. And she has to do it for me. Even though there are people there for me, I want my wife by my side. And, you, and I'm there two months. I'm not talking to her. No, it's not possible. That's where my life is. But there are people who, for one month, two months, they are not talking. It is not of God. Yes, somebody is telling me five years. It's bad. As for five years, you're not talking to her. You are not a human being. There's no marriage. You're not talking. You don't call, you don't call me, I don't call you. Don't call me. Look, when I'm, when I'm in town or I've traveled and for about three, four hours, I don't see my wife's call. Then I myself, I'm worried that you haven't called me for the past year. What's going on? Because it's not like her. She will call. What are you doing? Have you eaten? Whatever. There's text message checking me. I have, I, have to, I have to account for everything that I'm doing. So not to account for it. Very suspicious. Where are you? What have you reached? Have you finished preaching? How did the preaching go? Have you eaten? What are you eating? Do you like your food? Have you heated it? Have you put it in the microwave? Don't eat cold food. Okay, I'm about to sleep. Are you also sleeping? Yes, I'm sleeping. I'm also sleeping. This is after 35 years of marriage. Wow. 
6 a.m., I get the first call. When I see the call, then I put the phone down. I'll continue to sleep because I'm not in the mood to talk. But I'm expecting the, the phone to ring again for the 20 minutes. If it doesn't ring for 20 minutes, I'm surprised rather. Because you have to call me again. I have to do in church room small before I pick the call. <laughs> I see the phone and I put it down. I say, Steve, I call you thrice. I say, yeah, it's okay. I was sleeping. What do you expect? I was tired. Okay, what is it? Oh, I'm just checking up on you. That's checking up on you. Checking up on you. Three times. Okay, so what's going on? Have you called the children? Is everybody okay? Yes, everybody's okay. The alarm says he needs this. Okay, so go into my account. Brother, move the money. Take it to him. That's it. I sleep again. Four. Then ten. Are you up or you are still sleeping? I say, I'm still sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I'm still sleeping. So, Keto, I wonder how I can survive without talking. That's why I'm saying that it marvels me when a couple are not talking for four weeks, three weeks. Because I can't survive without it. My life depends a lot on her. Even when I'm not well, the children will be calling me, Daddy, are you well? I said, I'm not too well. And your mother has neglected me. She's gone to, I don't know where she's gone to. Then my children will call my mother. Daddy is, is in the house and he's sick and you have left. So, but I just took care of him. Then my wife will call me that. Ah, the children call me that. They say you are complete. I say yes. You left me here. After the medication, you have left me. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> That's the way my life has been, and I can't help it. You say, Pastor, it is like that. Ah, the twins of the same gene. Sorry, it is like that. I'm not living in Sunday, but it's also like that. <laughs> uh, are you there? Are you there? A faithful man. Who can find? May you be faithful. The Bible said in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 4. Daniel, chapter 6, verse 4. What does the Bible say? It says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find none occasion or fault for as much as he was what? A faithful. A faithful, and neither was there any error or fault found in him. May you be that faithful man called Daniel. May you be that faithful woman called Daniela. May you be found faithful. Say amen. Daniel, the female is Daniela. All right, number three, I'll end there. Number three, root of bitterness and unforgiveness. It can ruin a marriage. Roots of bitterness. Roots of bitterness. Exodus chapter 15, 22, 24. Exodus 15, 22, 24. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shaw and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. There are some waters in certain homes that are bitter. The water was supposed to quench their thirst, was supposed to make them drink and refresh themselves. But when they drank from the water after three days of walking, the waters were bitter. May God change your bitter waters into sweet water. Because the Bible said they cried, Moses cried unto the Lord and they cut a branch. When they threw the branch into the waters, the waters made me sweet. So there are certain branches that we must cut and put into the water that will change the waters in your marriage. Say amen. One of them is unfulfilled expectation. Unfulfilled expectation. People enter into marriages expect, with certain expectations that their lives will become better. That the husband will build them and take them to Dubai, take them to uh, London, US and all that and give them a better living. Some people have never seen the inside of an aeroplane before. So when I married, I was expecting my husband to save money and take me to Qatar or Dubai or uh, whatever. But it didn't happen. He 
creates bitterness. And the reason why it came in is because that was the promise you made to the girl. That was the raps. Get it out. Oh, our honeymoon will be in Dubai. Who worry me? So who share? Who said that worry me? I will show that. I will show you that me a bema pa. I will take care of you. May see that mouth. May see. May see. We say or him or makumem. Yes. May prove what you will say. I am the man. And I may show. I will take care of you. I will take care of your mother. I will take care of your father. And I will establish businesses for you. Who are I have some things in the pipeline that are coming through. Now, I will show you that I'm a husband. I'm not one of those chicken husbands. I'm the man. And five years on, nothing. The pipeline is blocked. <laughs> the Dubai didn't come on. I'm telling you a true story. And the guy ended up sucking the woman's money, rather. And the woman became bitter. So she left the man. He said, Daddy, it is not because I don't know. It's because of what he promised me. And rather, I am the one looking after him. I'm the one taking care of him. So all those things he said coming through the pipeline. Well, what, what, what is it? I'm a very bitter person because the little savings I have. You see, and she was saying, 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 this is my money. His money is our money. But I couldn't find his money. And he's taken from me. So I left him. Because my life was going down, 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 down. The little savings I have, I've given all to him. So I left him. Unfulfilled expectations. Don't say things that you cannot do. There's no need. So if you're in a relationship and the guy is telling you, look, I have two uncles in Germany, I have three sisters, I have three elderly sisters in uh, Ukraine, and I have this, 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 and say those things. No, most of the time they are not true. You that you are proposing to me, what do you have? What are you bringing to the table? <laughs> what are you bringing to the table? Not what your sister. Look, let me tell you something. When you see somebody living abroad, eh, it is not a very easy thing no? for him to pay his bills and still have some to send to you. When you have a sister who sends you $200, you should be grateful for it. You should be grateful for it. Or he sends you 100 pounds, 200 pounds. Or he, he manages to give you 500 pounds. Don't take it for granted. You don't know what it means to stay in the UK and save and get 500 pounds. It doesn't happen. So that money that your sister sent you, don't, don't, don't be, be this thing. I don't want you to use some words crowd on you. And just spend the money like that. Use it wisely. Make it an investment. Say amen. So, unfulfilled expectation create bitterness. And then, comparison and competition can create bitterness and unforgiveness. Comparing your relationship and your marriage to another family. Every family is different. Every family has a destiny. Every family and marriage is unique before God. So, your home must not be compared to the other homes. Don't visit a friend, see things in your house, and come back and trouble your husband. Because if you come to my house and you see a very big TV, don't go hustle because it's not easy to get a big TV. And I, for, you, for all you know, it's a gift. You know, my wife told a story here many years ago. It's a very funny story, but it's very true. That when, when they park, when the couple park their car, the man gets up from his car and comes and open the door for the woman. So every time, the man will pack the car, come and open the door. So the woman so he said, ah, he said, oh, so my pack my car. Oh, so he said, then the man will get up, go to the wife's side, and open the door for the wife to come up. Oh, yeah, be mommy. They be just a meow, me the man one thing, and the big car. So, 
the two families got talking. And the man said, hmm, but the mechanical should be called the other side of the door. <laughs> the other side of the door. Jesus, me see. Now me could be my wife. They made a workshop. Then the, the family got to know that. It's not because the man was so in love that he goes over. It's the door that is not working. The God has a problem. So you are watching somebody's family and you are comparing it to your home. Your small TV, be content with it. Your small gas cooker, be content with it. Your small kitchen, be content with it for now. Because you are, the marriage is a journey. The marriage is a journey. And this is your starting point. You are growing. You get money. You save. You buy a bigger gas, a bigger TV, a bigger... All of us who have come today, we didn't start. Our homes were not big. Our homes were, our homes were very small. Taifa, small room. One day I went to visit my mom and I entered my room before, before. When I entered, I said, yeah, right day. Those days, General used to come to my house. General will be 31 years since I got to know him. Because one year before we turned church, he used to visit me at Taifa. He used to drive me in his car to Taifa in a small room. And he stuck with me. Uh, so I went to visit my mom. And I went to my room. When I saw my room, I was shocked. I said, ah, was I living in this room? It was so small. But you see, if you come to my room now, it's a bigger room. With a bigger TV. With a bigger bed. With space for me to play football. From cooler to fridge. So you don't compare two homes. You don't, there's no compare, there's no competition. Your marriage is not on a race. Your marriage is not on trial. Your marriage is not under a marking scheme. You will get there. It may be rough, it may be long, but you, your marriage will get there. You are not in competition with the Joneses. They go on holidays and come. You go to Widiba and come. You are happy, go to Winneba. What is the Winneba? Is there anything in Winneba? Yeah, beach. Yeah, go walk there. Cape Coast. Fro yeah, just go and walk around. Let your children swim at the <laughs> whatever. You two, you have got to take pictures. Take pictures with your phone. Hello, we are here. No more, you know it is Winneba Beach. It could be Florida. It's your beginning. Though my beginning may be small, but my end shall be greatly increased. No competition. No comparison. Say amen. No violence. There should be no violence in your home. Emotional violence. Emotional violence. Physical violence. Torture. Depression. Oppression. Suppressing your spouse. It can affect the, 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 the sweetness of the marriage. Disrespect. Anytime you hear people talk on social media, uh, three things a man needs. Three things a man needs. A man needs his food. A man needs his respect. A man needs his uh, uh, sex. So is there only the man who makes the marriage? It is not the, the man who makes the marriage. It takes two to tango. So the woman also needs respect. It's mutual. I respect you, respect me. The Bible says that submitting ourselves one to another. Ephesians 5 to 9. Submitting to ourselves one to another. So when I hear people on social media, a man there, he needs his food. He needs his respect. He needs it. What about a woman too? She also needs respect. She also needs her food. She also, she's also a sexual person. She also needs sex. That is why I don't like men who for months they don't sleep with their wives. For weeks, for months, you don't have sex with your wife. So who are you having sex with? Are you a stone? God didn't wire men like that. You are staying for three months. Are you an imbecile? Are you impotent? Go get medicine. There are a lot of medicines around. Make love to the woman. Love her. Cuddle her. Have sex with her. Kiss her. She also, she's, uh, uh, she's also has needs. Oh, are you there? Yeah. yeah. 
She also has things. So the, 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 sometimes we tilt all the things to the men and the men and the man and man. Is the man the only human being in the family? There's also a woman there who needs emotional affection. Who needs sometimes when you put your hands around your wife and you draw closer to her, you don't know what it does to her. Close her, kiss her, rub your hand on the head, hold her waist tight. Smooch her. You are saying, hey, you used to smooch. <laughs> Girls. <laughs> yeah. Your own wife. Drink from your own system. When you are, when you are in a relationship, it's very easy. Hey, what am I? Five minutes, okay. I don't want to be told that I'm the one coming to spoil the timings of this house. Say amen. You need it. We also need, we also have to eliminate suffering in a marriage. Don't see your husband or your spouse suffer. Try and alleviate the suffering. People are bitter and unforgiving because of suffering. Some people don't care. They have no care. The woman is struggling, looking after the children and bathing the children, taking them to school, and the man doesn't care. It's a very bad thing. It can create unforgiveness and bitterness. Thank you. Thank you is a very important thing in a marriage. Thank you. I was telling the first service that a, a beautiful marriage in this church broke because of, no, because of lack of thank you. No appreciation. The woman went in, the married year, the woman got pregnant one month after the marriage, suffered, and she had a very difficult pregnancy, and she delivered a baby boy first. And the man came and, you know, carried the boy, boy, whatever, boy, boy, whatever, and then she delivered a second child. And the woman was very, very bitter. She came to her and said, Reverend Steve, I said, yeah, you and Mama Jane, I want to thank you for blessing my marriage, but I'm leaving my husband. I said, why are you leaving him? He didn't say thank you to me. I delivered two children. He didn't say thank you. He didn't do outdooring. He didn't do a big ceremony so that I can bring my friends for him to stand in public to appreciate me. Because he didn't do that. I believe him. And guess what? He left him. And the man went ahead and married another woman. And the woman also left him. And married another woman. The woman also left him. So the guy is single as I talk to you now. He's single. Because he doesn't know how to say thank you. They don't need it if the woman wants you, the women want you to appreciate the fact that I've been running this house while you are at work. So a little appreciation will help me. I was telling the first service people how a couple of days ago my wife woke me up at 3 a.m. And I found it very weird. She was shaking me at 3 a.m. She shook me and shook me again. So I said, honey, what is it? He said, well, on behalf of the children and on my own behalf, I want to say thank you. I said, for what? Because that day, I've taken them out. I said, everybody, enter the shop. Take what you want and bring it. I'm waiting here to pay for you. So everybody took gifts in the shop. And I paid for it. And she herself, she loaded her truck. <laughs> and she said, thank you to me. You see, it is my duty as a husband to prov- and a father to provide for my children. So she didn't have to wake me up to say thank you. But that act, it moved me. It, it, it triggered something. It, it, it did something to me as a man. Then I told my wife, it's the beginning, you see more. So thank you triggers something. And those of us who don't have to know how to say thank you, May God help you to know how to appreciate your spouse. I love you. God bless. We'll continue the rest next week.